Richard Atkinson received his PhD in 1955 from Bill Estes. He is President Emeritus of the University of California and Professor Emeritus of Cognitive Science and Psychology at the University of California, San Diego. In 1980, he became the fifth chancellor of UC San Diego, a position he held for 15 years. He then served as president of the UC system from 1995 to 2003. He is a former director of the National Science Foundation. Dick was a member of the Stanford faculty from 56 until 1980. His research dealt with problems of memory and cognition. His theory of human memory has been influential in shaping research in the field. It has helped clarify the relationship between brain structure, psychological, and psychological phenomena, in explaining the effects of uh, drugs on memory as well, and in formulating techniques that optimize the learning process. Dick's scientific contributions have resulted in numerous awards. He's elected to the National Academy of Sciences. He's been elected to the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Education, the American Philosophical Society as well. He is past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, former chair of the Association of American Universities, fellow of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, and the recipient of numerous honorary degrees. Something to ask him about at the banquet is that in addition to all that, a mountain in Antarctica has been named in his honor. <laughs> Dick, we're extraordinarily pleased to honor you today with the department's first Lifetime Achievement Award. We've asked Dick to make just a few remarks, but before he does so, I would like to make an announcement. That announcement is this, that the faculty has decided to name our Lifetime Achievement Award the Richard Atkinson Lifetime Achievement Award. For a moment there, I thought it was going to get off without having to make any remarks. But Bill said five minutes, and I'll try to stick closely to five minutes. It's been a very exciting day. I could say a lot about the history of the department and how it's really been very effective in the evolution of American psychology. Uh, but let me just comment that I do have a very special relationship to this 125th anniversary because I claim to have touched the lives of people from the beginning to this very moment in time. I came here in 1950, and if you take note of that date, that is exactly the midpoint of uh, 1988 to 2013. I arrived in 1950. Uh, William Lowe Bryant was still alive. He was about 90 years old. He walked regularly on the campus. Uh, we were housed in Science Hall, what's now called Lindley Hall, and on several occasions when he came by, I stopped and chatted with him, and on one occasion I walked him back to the president's house. Very cordial, very pleased to know that I was a psychology graduate student. Uh, after leaving here in 1950, I obviously kept track of a lot of the faculty here and the people who came out of the programs. I sent quite a few undergraduates uh, to Indiana University for their PhDs, and they always had a very good experience. And of course, I have two of my most distinguished PhDs uh, as long-term members of the faculty here, Rich Schifrin and Jim Townsend. I might say that both of them have had numerous offers to move elsewhere, and I hate to admit it, but I've been involved in trying to <laughs> But we were never successful, and I think it's because the, they find Indiana a very congenial place to do their research and teaching because they are so committed to research and teaching. Um, so, so I do claim this uh, contact with the full 125 years. 
Uh, as I said, I arrived here in 1950. Uh, we were housed in Science Hall, what's now called Lindley Hall, and we had facilities spread over the campus. Uh, every faculty member and every graduate student was fully engaged in research, and almost all of the work was experimental work. Uh, there were only two programs of psychology at that time, experimental psychology and clinical psychology. The clinical psychologists had to do every course, had to participate in every experimental program that the uh, students in experimental psychology had to participate in, but then in addition, had courses in clinical areas and uh, the year's internship. My wife was uh, one of those students. Uh, we married while we were here at Indiana University and we celebrated our 61st uh, wedding anniversary uh, this uh, last summer. Uh, I comment on that because she always felt that the training was too difficult and too much, there was too much of a demand on her. But the simple fact is that the clinical people who came out of Indiana University in the 50s were the ones who really laid the foundation in so many clinical programs for the scientific uh, approach to uh, uh, the work. So the program was really quite amazing. I uh, will tell you that at the time I arrived, there were, as I said, every faculty member was fully engaged in research and had their own individual laboratories, but there were several laboratories that were department-wide. One was a psychophysical laboratory, uh, anechoic chamber, wonderful facilities. Uh, we were thoroughly exposed to the developments of information theory and uh, signal detection theory as those ideas had evolved out of World War II. Uh, there was another laboratory, a psychophysiology laboratory that Roland Davis headed. It was principally focused on human subjects, uh, recording five or six uh, uh, psych uh, biological variables in psychological situations. That laboratory was a state-of-the-art laboratory, and history will show that it was the first it was in the group of the first awards made by the Office of Naval Research. NSF had not been set up yet at the time. It was in legislation. Uh, ONR was filling in for supporting uh, research. Uh, I don't know how many of you realize this, but there was virtually no money coming from the federal government to support a research in universities before World War II. That was a post-World War II development, and the first group of uh, project supported by ONR was the psychophysiological laboratory here at Indiana University. There was a, a Pavlovian conditioning laboratory, dog laboratory, somewhere over in Alpha Hall, quite an amazing facility at the time, and everyone was involved in it. Uh, and there was a huge vivarium, one of the largest I think I'd ever seen at the time, uh, pigeons and uh, rats. Uh, and again, my wife, when she first arrived as a graduate student, her job was to tame uh, the animals for subsequent research. She never, never felt she was quite treated properly in that regard. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I do want to mention, because it really was important, is that we had a fabulous shop. The shop was well equipped. There was a shop man, several assistants, anything in electronics or with construction, uh, they were prepared to uh, put forward. I arrived at Stanford in 1956. I looked around, the shop that was there could have been put in the closet of the shop that uh, was at Indiana University. Uh, of course, I came here to work with Bill Estes. Uh, stimulus sampling theory in the 50s was just beginning to become clear and uh, it was a very exciting moment. I think from a national perspective, everybody was watching Indiana University and one of the high points was the development of stimulus sampling theory, but I would be misrepresenting things if I suggested that that was the dominant theoretical view at Indiana in those days. Information theory was very much on people's mind. Uh, signal detectability theory was much discussed and many students interested in it. 
McCulloch's uh, neural network uh, theories were much discussed. It was a very broad-based program, and I would characterize the program as being very experimental in character, but very, very sophisticated in theoretical work. Uh, IU, as I said, and as everyone else has said, has been a defining influence uh, of American psychology, but it was a defining influence in my life, uh, not only as a scientist, but also as an academic administrator. Uh, after I left Indiana University, I got to know Herman Wells fairly well because we served on two national commissions together, and I was always very impressed by his leadership. Clearly, Brian, President Brian, was a great leader of this institution. Herman Wells, uh, for his 25 years, was also a great leader of this institution. And on another public occasion, I commented that I thought that the current president, Michael McRoby, was uh, in the same group of truly distinguished presidents of Indiana University. It's been a wonderful 125th uh, anniversary, and I can tell you I'm very pleased to have been here. Thank you very much. <laughs>